está duro. Pero México está duro. Bueno, está aquí pues, es bonito, pero nada más que como que me dice lo duro es que tienes que andar escondiéndote. Eh, no. La verdad como que no, no resulta pues andar escondiendo de aquí y de allá. O sea, te tiene un papel pues legal, pues no te hacen nada, pero salen muy caros los papeles y además no es por mucho tiempo, la mayoría creo que los que vienen son por ocho meses. La verdad pues este pueblito son muy racistas, la verdad. Pero la verdad no nos gusta vernos aquí, pero la verdad no sé por qué. Pues yo vine porque, pues la verdad, como yo no tengo casa en México, por, pues ese fue mi propósito, venir hasta acá. Nada más que yo me vine hasta acá porque como mi papá aquí estaba, aquí está seguido, estaba como a cinco minutos. Y si sí hay, pero, pero, pues es que hay, 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 este, pues no es como aquí, pues aquí la mayoría son puros ranchos de, de vacas. ¿no? de otras cosas pero allá no pues las cosas son los más pues puro como el cacao el maíz todo eso que es lo que se cosecha en el año y si sí hay trabajo pero muy poco la verdad si sí, lo que te pagan pues como quien dice no da para nada tienes que echar desde las 6 de la mañana hasta mediodía y, y lo que te pagan no la verdad no te alcanza para nada si sí, la verdad pues la mayoría por pues por eso nos venimos por acá, porque aunque traemos un poquito más, pero sale más. Pues aquí da lo mismo. Porque pues. Uh, my name is Chris Urban, and I'm the English teacher with the Addison County Migrant Education Program. And I cover pretty much all of Addison County. And I go farm to farm, mostly dairy farms, teaching English to migrant Mexican workers. It's a full-time job. I've been doing it for two and a half years. And I'm not a qualified ESL or ELL teacher, but just accumulated some experience, I guess. And I feel like I can relate to the guys just being young like them. Fue el otro año en, en marzo me parece. En marzo del otro año. Pero no más tarde como cinco meses porque me agarró la migración. Oye que iba a hablar para la casa y quién sabe cómo. Por estar viendo la 
televisión. Escuché ahí en el, el 911. Pero pues yo para marcar para allá tengo que marcar 011. Por estar viendo televisión y está con el teléfono, se me olvida y, y en vez de poner 011 le pongo 911. Pero pues yo cuando pensé que iban a llegar los polis, nunca lo, lo marqué y lo volví a colgar y después empecé a hablar por teléfono. Y al rato tenía quizá como de 10 a 15 minutos cuando llegaron los polis. Pues nos llevaron, como nos pidieron papeles, pero como no tenían, pues no. Nos llevaron, nos, nos llevaron primero hasta... ¿Cómo es que se llama ese pueblito? Hasta Albany, Albany, algo así. Ahí nos tardaron tres días encerrados. De ahí, después de esos tres días, nos llevaron hasta Boston. De ahí nos tardaron 15 días. A mí, a mi papá. Y de ahí de eso, pues... Pues decían unos ahí, pues ya me habían espantado porque dice que ahí una vez que te meten ahí no tenían pienso de salir y según uno, nos había dicho al poli que íbamos ahí este, con el juez y nunca nos llevaron. Y pasaron los días y los días y los días y nada. Y tuvimos que hablar con el, con el consulado y ese fue el que nos ayudó a salir. Y nos metió, bueno, a mí me metieron deportación. Tengo dos deportaciones. My name is Harold Guyard. I am a state senator from Addison County, a uh, former uh, dairy farmer in Addison County, town of Bridport actually. Uh, the farming population is such a small percentage that in terms of voting, voting, uh, uh, there's no threat there. Uh, uh, the population numbers have declined a great deal. It's a tremendous amount of work. The hours are early in the morning and, and later in the evening and uh, that's hard to ask people to work that hard. We have built a system of agriculture in this country on cheap labor or labor that's not paid uh, to produce a product for corporate America so that we have plenty of food in this country that doesn't cost much. People ask us, why aren't you going and picking up immigrants? Uh, what does an immigrant look like? Does he look different than you or I? I mean, I, I'm not really sure what that, that looks like. If he's an immigrant from Mexico, does he look different from an immigrant from Sweden? Probably. But who are we to be picking people out based on their looks as to what kind of action we're going to take? We have a specific policy here in Middlebury that prevents any kind of racial profiling or any kind of racial um, identification at all as a means of taking enforcement action. We just don't do it. are struggling right now. Milk prices over the last 10 or 12 years in Vermont have been as bad as any time historically. And right now we're in a temporary blip where milk prices have gone up, but so has the cost of fuel, the cost of fertilizer, the cost of grain. They continue to struggle. So what do they do? They employ mostly Mexicans who come to the state because they work hard, they're great people, they're incredibly positive, and they can make in one day uh, what they would make in a week in Mexico if they were lucky. So, aquí llevo como, no sé, como, como un año y siete meses quise aquí. Vienen recorriendo mucho, como, no sé, como tres días de Tabasco hasta la frontera. La primera vez pues, no, no lo sentí mucho, pero pues ahora pues como fue bastante y más que venía yo enfermo, que tenía yo tapado aquí el, el pecho y la garganta y con gripa, calentura, dolor de hueso. Y venía yo ya, la primera noche no quería yo caminar, nada más que como venía mi hermanito más chiquito pues no lo quise dejar tirado tampoco. <risa> bueno, cuando yo vine, o sea, salen gente y te saltan. Bueno, a mí me asaltaron, me quitaron el dinero. Pero, o sea, no te hacen nada, solamente que, o sea, querés de que hagas lo que te digan. O sea, si ellos quieren dinero, solamente. Revisan la ropa, cachucha, tenis, 
raja los tenis, lo que sea, a ver si traes dinero, aparte del que ya les da. Some of my students have had to take drugs across. Drug lords will, the smugglers will say, carry these drugs across or we'll kill you. And so they're the drug mule. Tardamos como dos noches, parece, sin descansar, caminando día, un día y una noche sin descansar. Ahí es donde se nos, pues nos, nos cansaron los pies porque, te imaginas, no nos dejaban que nos paráramos caminando y sí. caminando y caminando y caminando. Y, y lastimados, acá les vamos a They cross into places like Nogales, uh, Agua Prieta, um, Sasabe. Those are some of the towns that they've told me where they cross. And they'll spend a day or two crammed in a, in a house or a room or an apartment, either on an Indian reservation near the border in America uh, or in Phoenix. And then from there, they'll get on this migratory route and uh, the, someone who works for the coyote will take them in a van and just spread them throughout the veins of America, dropping them off here and there. Hi, I'm Cheryl Connor, and I live in Addison County, Vermont. Um, I've been working with the migrant workers for probably about four to five years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because of word of mouth via the telephone, they found out that if you work in a farm in Vermont, you pretty much have stability. The cows have to be milked seven days a week. You usually get your house provided for you, you get your electricity, um, your telephone, and so many of them came up here. Many times they have no um, experience milking cows, but they go to visit a relative, they stay there, they kind of learn what to do, and the next thing you know somebody's calling you and saying, I've got this relative uh, of one of my workers and they're looking for a job. Are you looking for another man? And that's how it basically works in this area with migrant workers. I teach 45 qualifying students on different farms. And then there are other students who don't qualify but participate with the English classes. What makes the student the student has to be 22 years old or younger, and they have to be a migrant worker involved in agriculture. So you push, push this, and the water comes out push, and the sale agua, water comes out. A la vaca. Okay, here's comida de las vacas. Here's the food, the food. This is the, the feed wagon para alimentar las vacas. Come on in. This is a tanque de comida. This is a tanque de comida. This is a tanque de comida. In English, silo. The, the food comes, comes down. Viene? Si. Mm -hmm. Este es uno y este es el otro. Here's the other silo. Silo. Son dos dos tipos creo de comida. Two types of food. Dos dos tipos de comida. A lot of these people, you know, dairy farm is not seasonal work, but 
the nature of being a migrant worker is that you're always moving and the majority of these guys will be up here for a year to three years but you know, maybe the boss is not such a great person or maybe they want to live with their brother or cousin and so they're always moving. Does he uh, like working on the farm with the cows? Does he enjoy it at all? Siempre me ha gustado trabajar sin lo de las vacas. Me agrada el trabajo. Estoy tranquilo aquí. He, he trabajado en otro rancho, pero trabajé en uno. No me acuerdo cómo. En Orlean creo que se llamaba. Algo así. Orlean. O... No me acuerdo del nombre. ¿Dónde? En Vermont. No. Creo que así aquí era en Vermont, pero estaba como de a cuatro horas de aquí. Ya estaba, creo que faltaba casi cinco minutos rayando con, <risa> con, <risa> con Canadá. Ya estaba del otro lado allá. Seguí haciendo la vacación. Nada más que pues yo me salí de ahí porque don ese pues... Pues quisiera uno de esos racistas porque te, te, te hacía trabajar todo el día desde las tres y media de la mañana hasta las nueve de la noche. Y no te daba chance de ya comer ni nada. Estaba rudo así. ¿Y pagaban bien o no? Según la hora me la estaba pagando como a 5, me parece. A veces en la semana antes yo 92 horas. ¿Y aquí a veces es 95. Siete, eh, a veces me, me salió una semana con 415. La tenía yo como 70, 80 caballos, limpiaba yo. Los cepillaba yo. Les daba yo comida. Todo. Después de eso. En tres horas lo tenía que ten, tener listo. Después de eso me dio ordeña 1700 vacas. Entre dos. Las 12 horas, desde las 7 de la mañana hasta las 7 de la tarde, sin descansar. Después de eso tenía que regresar otra vez a los caballos. Así que tenía los caballos. Terminaba hoy como a las 9, 9 y media de la noche. Y todavía a esa hora llegué a comer desde las 3 de la mañana y hacer comida. Y no me gustó, se lo dije, pues que la verdad no me gustó porque le, lo único que le pedí es que me diera permiso de que sea de, de una comida. Me dijo que no. One of the things that I decided to do when I first started working with the migrant workers was develop a church service for them. Uh, my name is Gerard Leclerc. I'm a priest from the Diocese of Vermont. I work in Virgins, St. Peter's. I've been there now five, going on six years. Somebody told me that he spoke Spanish fluently. He had been uh, a missionary um, down in South America and called him and he was like, yes, this is great. This is really what we need to be doing. Uh, we thought it'd be good that they have a mass. And uh, so we've had this now for quite a while. felt, number one, the biggest problem they have is isolation. It's a safe, safe place. There's a, a meal, and there's the service. A lot of them are Catholic, so it's really nice for them to you know, be able to worship.
just a church service, but there's uh, like a you know vaccinations and a clinic that goes along with it. There's occasionally a soccer game that follows, uh, clothing donations. So it's really uh, it's turned into a, a community center. If you got Spanish-speaking workers, uh, then it's interesting to see how various farmers handle it differently. Some of them say, well, my guys have to learn English, and that's the way life is. Uh, I guess we're kind of learning both. A, a veces sí, a veces sí, pero casi nunca. Bueno, ya nos acostumbramos que él habla un poquito español, bueno, de lo que uno le va enseñando, le está tratando de enseñar correcto las palabras que uno le dice. Y bueno, lo entendemos así todo mezclado, el inglés, un poco de inglés, un poco de español, todo revuelto. Bueno, sí nos entendemos. A veces sí no lo entiendo. Sí, la verdad sí es difícil porque pues a veces te tratan de, de entender algo, a veces cuando te están regañando, pues a veces se les nota porque dicen cosas que no se escucha cuando andan alegre. Ahí es lo único que les entiendo yo que están. No, y el problema es que a veces te regañan. A veces, como somos varios, a veces uno hace una cosa y, y no te sabes defender. El mal que se imagina, ahí se le cae. ¿Y cómo le digo que no soy yo? As, as far as uh, English classes go, I've never seen more motivated students. You know, I've taught Spanish to other high schoolers, and um, these guys want to learn. They need to learn. They, uh, some of them can't even write their own name, but they, you know, they know some, some key vocabulary words for dairy farm work. <laughs> Alright, so number one is call, call, call up, call, 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 up, the same the palabra, up, up, mm -hmm. call, up, up. Uh -huh. Up. Up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have dog? Yes. Um, how many? How many do you have? How many yeah, dogs? Ah, oh, how many dog do you have? She has little lips. And does she have beautiful eyes, Ricardo? Does she have beautiful eyes or ugly eyes? Easy. No sé, me interesa. O sea, sí, porque cualquier persona que te habla y te sientes mal cuando alguien te habla y no sabes qué decir, no sabe qué responder. Decir sí, decir no, quién sabe o quién es este o quién es el otro. Eso, o sea, no, no, no te deja bien. Cualquier cosa te dicen y tú te quedas así, volteas aquí, volteas allá y no sabes qué decir. Y, y o sea, nadie que te ayude. Y eso no... Bueno, a mí no me gusta, pues. Y yo, yo sí quiero aprender inglés. Pero, bueno, es difícil, pero... No entiendo nada. Lo, lo único que me causa es risa. Como ahorita se ponen a hablar. <risa> no sé ni qué es lo que están diciendo. Digo, no, mejor me río y me quedo contento. Con eso me quedo contento.
the guy that's working for us now, uh, he, uh, he would, when he first came here, wasn't planning on learning English. But then when he finally figured out that we're very interested in learning Spanish and that in order for us to be able to get good dialogue in the process, he's going to learn English. The bosses really appreciate it. I know a number of farmers who've started taking Spanish classes and you know, are trying to teach themselves. And I think that shows mutual respect. The best way to understand other people is to A, have a grasp of their language and B, have a grasp of their culture. In the process, one doesn't come without the other. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we think that just because we're Americans and we speak English that we shouldn't be speaking some, some other language, but maybe we ought to take a good hard look at that. The fact that we are not very in touch with other cultures, especially like a Latin, Latin cultures, that's true. We don't have that contact. And it makes us difficult, uh, that gives us a difficulty because it's always hard to, to deal with uh, people that we do not understand and whose language we do not understand. I personally think we should teach certain languages like Spanish. We should be teaching that more to the kids, especially at young ages when they can really learn it quickly. I think Vermont, under the current, there's still a prejudice here. There's still, in Vermont, a prejudice. Uh, and you could very possibly see a pushback of, uh, uh, because of that. On the surface, Vermonters uh, would claim we're not prejudiced, but I think that we still are. When I say that Vermont is extraordinarily accepting of others, always has been historically. I don't want to suggest to you that I don't think we, that we have folks who discriminate against others based upon the color of their skin. Of course we do. There's hatred and discrimination in every part of American society, and Vermont's not excluded from it. All I'm saying is that I think that Vermonters, by and large, are more tolerant, more accepting, and more willing to change and to be objective and open-minded than most places in the country. I think a great idea would be, you know, last year we had that event right at the Congo Church in Middlebury and have another symposium up there and, uh, you know, just bring all the, you know, speakers and invite the public in and get a few, you know, local speakers and, mm -hmm. and that would be a great way to get people immediately involved. A number of concerned citizens in Addison County formed a group several years ago, the Addison County Migrant Worker Coalition, and we're trying to, our goal initially was to promote more awareness about um, the existence of migrant Mexican farm workers in Vermont, specifically to Addison County. I'm Cheryl Connor, and I'm a nurse here at Home Health, and um, I work with the migrant workers um, for the Spanish Mass that happens in a um, little town outside of Middlebury. When we started the Migrant Workers Coalition, we decided that what we wanted to do is um, help the migrant workers in access to health care, education, and at least have people in this area realize that there was diversity and that the diversity was good in this area, and that the migrant workers were definitely serving a valuable role. They were helping our dairy farms to stay in business. By promoting this awareness, we wanted to provide immediate services to farmers and the migrant farm workers. We identified needs of translation, transportation, health, and then secondary needs like uh, you know, visiting a friend or a family member on a nearby farm, uh, going to church, um, 
you know, having fun once in a while. Our first meeting of the Migrant Workers Coalition was really exciting. We had so many people who showed up who really wanted to help this migrant group. And so we decided that we would, what we would do is try to meet monthly. And we have met monthly for at least three years. So many things have come out of this Migrant Workers Coalition. And I think basically it's because of the volunteers and the group. Um, you know, it ranges from farmers to policymakers, professors, students, um, you know, obviously farmers and, and migrant workers, just, it, it's an amazing group of people. And uh, it's still going strong. Uh, the second thing is, you know, thanks to many people who are part of this coalition, that the Middlebury Police Department passed a hands-off policy as well as the Board of Selectmen. So now, I, th I think our next places to look are the police departments in Bristol and Virgins. Cheryl Mitchell, myself, and uh, um, Susanna McCandless uh, wrote some legislation that we want the state of Vermont to at least consider. And I guess it's coming up again, and it's for um, food preparation um, people that at least they have a minimum standard of health care. Anybody involved in food preparation, which is also your migrant workers who work on dairy farms. You know, we've gotten f free vaccinations, free food, free clothing. So it's, it's a necessary group of people if, if you want to make positive change. important for this community so that we don't have people excluded. We don't have a subculture out there somewhere that can't uh, seek public services because they may be afraid of being deported that won't um, provide support for the rest of the community as far as witnesses, as far as reporting crimes, as far as um, uh, just being you know absorbed into the community at large. So I invited Tom here today just to be able to give us a little insight because you know they they passed the policy in Middlebury which was so so wonderful for our migrant workers and how we had talked at the last migrant workers coalition meeting about possibly contacting the Virgins police and maybe the Shelburne police and to see if we can you know get some more positive uh, uh, enforce reinforcement on this whole policy so and Tom we wanted to just know what and you spoke to me a little bit about it because you can you give the, the group a little bit about what you've been thinking it's probably difficult for me to go to another police chief in another town and tell them what we think is best for them to do <laughs> uh, some of the small departments around here don't have a lot of written policies and things anyway and they just they don't have a lot of activity so they don't get involved in a lot of this stuff. We saw the need here that we had to do something. And I, we wanted everything to be consistent in a standard way to deal with issues. Um, after all, you know, a policeman takes an oath when he the office to uphold all the laws, and obviously we can't do that. I mean, we don't enforce every law in the books. I mean, that'd be crazy. We can't do that. We don't enforce tax laws or any of those other things or federal laws about things. So, but we want, didn't want to get our officers in a position where one officer would be acting one way and another would be acting another way and everything would be consistent. If, if we don't recognize that these folks are not a threat to us, then, then we're going to close off that information pipeline. Nobody's ever going to talk to us. And their people are still going to come here, only they're going to do it under the cloak of, uh, you know, darkness, sort of. I think that is a, a real statement of on our society, um, a real stigma of our society, frankly, and it's almost a black eye that anybody working in our society um, has to be so secretive about their work for fear of being extradited, uh, for fear of being separated from their children. And I, I just find it very ironic that in a, in a presidential scenario where our current president talks about moral values and family values, that uh, his own law enforcement is, as, um, is so strict about this kind of thing that it's dividing families and it's, it's very immoral. Um, 
I, mean, I happen to think this president's pretty immoral in a lot of ways for someone who talks about moral values and family values. But this is a real direct example of it where you know, families have to work and operate and live in secret. What, what is that in our society? What have we become? No sé qué piensa Bush. <laughs> o sea, no, no sé por qué. Bueno, no, sé que es como todo. Hay personas malas en México también que... O sea, imagínate si le das papeles a una persona mala que te puede hacer desastre en Estados Unidos. Es como todo. Por eso pienso que no quiere. Pero, pero no todas las personas son así. Bueno, para también no, no vamos a buscar quiénes son buenos y quiénes son los malos. Pero no sé, está un poco difícil. No sé por qué. Bueno, algunos vienen a trabajar, al menos como yo. Yo no vengo a trabajar, no vengo a matar, ni a robar, ni a nada por el estilo. Y... Y, y, o sea, yo pienso que lo que digan otras personas o el racismo, no, o sea, no me interesa. No, o sea, no me interesa lo que digan, mientras no me toquen o algo así, no. O sea, no, no me interesa mucho. We are the whitest or one of the whitest states in the, in the nation. And um, people are also more comfortable with what they're familiar with. And we're not familiar with uh, we just aren't exposed to the other s races, their culture, um, their language. Um, and we're not always so comfortable in getting to know them either. Uh, that's not easy for us. Anybody who comes here who has a different color or a different size or whatever uh, sticks out a little bit. And as I've told some people, I said, maybe what we need is another 40 or 50,000 of them. Then it'd be all homogeneous. <laughs> Before I started my work, I didn't even know much about the migrant worker situation. And uh, you know, I had no idea they were in from a hunt. And I'm really fortunate that I've had this opportunity to get to know these people and to, to meet people who disagree with me and to learn about their perspectives. They're human beings just like all the rest of us. They eat, they talk, they laugh, they cry. They do all the same things that we do. And, uh, and you know, they just want to be able to continue doing them. You, you need to be immersed with these people in the situation to really gain a better understanding. And I still feel like I'm, I'm just barely understanding the situation. Like my trip down to Mexico was my effort to better understand who these people are, why they, why they come here. And as I go around and I lecture to different groups, I tell people migrant workers are here for two to three years and they're trying to make an income that will last them a lifetime in Mexico. You, you gotta realize is that our business functions on the fact that we need good dependable labor and it if we don't have it, then basically we're just going to go out of business. The truth is that if Vermont fell off the chart in milk production, it wouldn't make such a huge dent that the nation would notice. It would totally change Vermont life. And our struggle as policymakers has been to work together with farmers to find ways to allow them to still survive economically because we know that Vermont's future depends on farms. I think uh, the Border Patrol, INS, is politically astute enough not to sweep in that and, 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 and run onto every farm and start rounding up that workforce. I think their approach in the past has been to, to sweep into one farm and that sends a message and a ripple throughout the entire industry and that's why our workers at the moment are working under the cloak of darkness. I hate to admit it, but I, I think people like to ignore it too. You know, they don't want to admit that, you know, the milk that they have in their cereal bowl is being milked by migrant Mexicans. And uh, people don't like to think about that, or don't like to think that you know, the orange juice in Tropicana is produced by migrant workers or the strawberries from California are picked by migrant workers. It's, it's an easy detachment. Dicen que, no sé, dicen que algunos americanos no, no quieren hacer el trabajo que un mexicano hace. O, pero dicen, pero no sé, yo la verdad no, no o sé, sea, no, como no los conozco mucho, no puedo decir que sí o que no. Pero, no, o sea, no sé, simplemente 
trato de hacer lo, lo mejor que puedo y, y lo que no puedo, pues no lo hago. Yeah, I think it's too bad also that the Mexicans are even here. They don't want to be here, they want to be with their families. And the farmers, to be honest, I don't think they really want to hire these guys. Like, you know, it's too bad that milk prices aren't good enough that they could pay Americans a good enough wage that Americans would want to work here. La jaula de oro se llama. Como que ni sé la jaula de oro, pero no deja de ser presión. Está uno, aquí tiene uno todo. Las cosas las puedes, la, como que dice, las obtienes más fácil. No te cuestan tanto. Pero estás como que dice, escondiendo. Te das cuenta que estás encerrado. No tiene caso. Aunque sea Dios, no tiene caso. It's just so simple to me. It's like you know, how, how you treat someone, or, uh, you know, what respect is, what, what goodness is, and, you know, it's kind of a, a black and white, a yes and no thing to me sometimes. And I, I just get frustrated when, when there's that gray area, when, when to me it's so obvious, how can politicians be debating how free these people should be when, when it, they gotta be free, you know? It's, where is it? Why are we even debating this? It's like, you, you know, you should, you deserve freedom. You're a man, brother of humanity, I don't get it. They, uh, you know, they debate all these compromising, the things that compromise their freedoms, and I don't get it. Pues la, la, la mayoría como que dice de la gente no es así. Como que dice es como todos, hay buenos y hay malos. Hay, hay igual la, como que dice gente mexicana allá en México que tampoco les gusta ver los americanos allá. Como que dice no, no hacen nada que anden, como que dice ahí en México. Pues. Como que dice al contrario, debe de dar gusto porque lo visitan, como que dice andan, no cualquiera como que dice se, se mete hasta allá. Pues yo ahorita la mayoría de, de americanos, pues, en México, pues, la verdad, casi en todo México hay americanos, igual como aquí, como los mexicanos.